All right, folks, we are live. Welcome everyone to another artist talk at Able Contemporary Gallery. We are so delighted to be joined by the artists Karen Holt and Julianne Shibata. They have an exceptional show up right now in the gallery called An Extraordinary Beauty. And that show is up from July 23rd through September 12th. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the Able Contemporary Gallery, we are located just outside of Madison, Wisconsin in beautiful historic Stoughton. Um, and so Karen is a painter and Julianne is a ceramicist. And what we'll be doing today is first looking at a video of the installation in the gallery. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about both of these artists and then we're going to talk about a few pieces um, from the show by each of these artists. And then at the end of the talk, we'll open it up for a question and answer. Um, by the way, my name is Teresa Abel, and I'm the owner and director of Abel Contemporary. And I am also joined by Lauren Miller um, and Ann Orleski on staff. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I also want to mention that this is streaming live on Facebook, um, and you can certainly throughout the talk, if you have a question, you can type that in, and at the end, we will talk to Karen and Julianne, and, and they will answer your questions. If you're watching this through our website, um, there isn't a box there for you to ask questions, but you are certainly welcome to text the gallery. And then Anne is actually keep, uh, has a, the phone and we, she can read your questions. And the phone number is 608-845-6600. Again, that's 608-845-6600. Um, and so as you are watching this video of um, Karen and Julianne's show, I'm gonna tell you a little bit first about Julianne. Um, her work investigates the contrast between the transience of nature and the relative stability of fired ceramics in a beauty that can be both ephemeral and enduring. Julianne is a ceramic artist from Northfield, Minnesota. She received her MFA from Bowling Green State University and has taught at Carleton and Hope Colleges as well as the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Julianne's work has been included in the 2019 Blanc de Chine International Ceramic Art Award exhibition in Beijing, China. She was the recipient of the Tile Heritage Pre Primo Award at the 23rd Annual San Angelo National Ceramic Competition and received first place in the 62nd Arrowhead Regional Biennale. Shibata was also awarded Artist Initiative Grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board in 2014, 2018, and 2020. In 2016, she was co-curator of Michi Distinctive Paths, Shared Affinity, an exhibition of Japanese American ceramic artists which traveled across the US. Her work belongs to the permanent collection of Northern Arizona University's Art Museum and the Brown Foreman Collection. Most recently, Julianne was awarded the McKnight Artist Fellowship for Ceramic Artists. That was just announced a few days ago. Congratulations, Julianne. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so we're gonna chat with you first and then we'll talk to Karen in a little bit. So um, the show is stunning and the work uh, looks beautiful paired together as you could just see from the video. So um, let's first start talking about these vases. Yeah, these were uh, new motifs for me. So a lot of the surface decoration on the ceramics in this show is inspired by Japanese folk art. Um, I was fortunate to go to Japan several summers ago um, and just really immerse myself in the museums and um, a lot of folk art museums. It's a particular interest of mine um, because in the 1920s, there was a Minge movement, um, which really embraced 
the work of the hand and celebrated the folk crafts at a time when the industrial age was really sort of, um, you know, taking over the world. Uh, so I, I really find um, beauty in everyday objects just a, a special thing. So this motif in particular is uh, said to be a curtain motif. And this, I was looking at a book of Aribe ware. So that was from the 15 to 1600s in Japan. And the note on the particular um, ceramic piece I was looking at had a sort of tent-like or curtain-like motif with some cherry blossoms and said that the curtain motif could be an element um, from the cherry blossom viewing parties um, in the spring. So here, I, I love pattern in general. Um, we find it everywhere in our daily lives, um, from napkins to architectural ornament to tablecloths and wrapping paper. Um, and, and this in particular, I'm really playing with um, the scale of the pattern on the textile ornament of that curtain and then some larger overall um, floral motifs. So how, um, uh, how, how much are, do you sort of look at these motifs and then go with it and change them and they evolve or do you remain historically accurate in any way? I, I play quite a bit, which is um, I think so healthy for me as an artist to have to be able to kind of have a looseness and also safety in numbers, throw many vases and um, you have a little more wiggle room uh, in the ceramic process for, you know, if something doesn't go right, you still have some other pieces. Um, so experimentation helps. And I, I feel like the current motif um, was, it's uh, very different. So if I were to show you um, the picture in the book I was looking at, it, you, you'd see maybe a little bit of resemblance and sort of the draping of the fabric. Um, but it's it's quite different. So I feel like I'm in, I'm inspired, and I'll I'll draw references, but then they they quickly change um, to my own motifs. And for instance, like on the vase uh, on the right, the white marks on that curtain um, are referencing another pattern I had seen like somewhere else. Um, that is Japanese, but then I'm playing with different colors and different um, marks and um, it, the, the work is pretty loose too in terms of the way I'm, I'm painting on the, the pieces rather than, so that does come from um, Japanese ceramic painting rather than the textiles, which are more formal and um, structured. Yeah. And then for people who, who maybe have questions about technical things, so to get this effect and this real painterly effect, um, do you bisque fire it and then do the painting? How many firings does a piece like this go through? Yeah, so the clay body is porcelain um, and you can see there's sort of a one fourth at the very bottom of that image. It's just the bare clay and then the glaze is the glass coat. And so um, you have the clay and it's thrown and then I, I do bisque fire it, which makes it um, hard, so it can no longer distort, but it also is still porous, so I can apply um, the decorative elements and the glaze. So I use a lot of underglazes, and actually quite a few of these underglazes are from a travel to China. I went to the porcelain capital of the world, um, Jingdezhen, in 2011, and um, a lot of the underglazes are almost like um, how you would apply watercolor, um, but they're with ceramic pigment. So it's very watercolor brushy style. Um, so I apply that on first and that's why they're called underglaze. And then this is a, a glaze I use quite a bit um, because I like how it runs in the kiln. So you can see some of the haziness you might get, um, especially on the vase on the right, some of that blue is bleeding down. Um, that's all from the kind of melting process in the kiln where things start start moving a bit. Um, and you can see the red pigment I used didn't move as much. Um, so, so different um, colors have different qualities in the kiln. Um, yeah. And then it comes out of the kiln and th there are a couple pieces in the show that do have a gold um, overglaze. And that's um, basically the last step if I wanna add any gold accents, um, I just apply the luster and then fire it at a low temperature but it's hot enough to fuse with the glass coat um, onto the ceramic piece. They're just beautiful. And they, I mean, they do, they have a painterly quality. Um, oh, and here's more, great. So these are a collection of plates, right? 
Yep. So you can see um, I'm playing with the curtain motif again on that uh, plate on the far left, and then also the scale of the decoration, um, trying to overlap some patterns on top of others. Um, and then just referencing again um, the Japanese decoration for most of these pieces, although some you might not see it as much like the one on the bottom right may not come across as much. So it's fun to just break the pieces up into different um, shapes. And these are all the same size plate, right? But they all have different feels based on the composition and, and color and combination of negative and, and busy space with the pattern. And, and so no two of these is the same. So when you're working, I'm assuming you throw a bunch of plates and then you, and do you have a, sort of a plan about what the patterns are gonna be, or do you at this point, you've done it for so long, do you work intuitively? Um, I think for this body of work, it was pretty intuitive. Uh, so I will have sort of a structure. I work best with um, like, okay, I'm gonna throw 12 plates. And then um, when it comes to the glazing, then I think I do approach the glazing a little more intuitively, like look at um, all my reference sheets or photocopies of from um, books that I've been really attracted to and see what really hits me that day. And then I'll start um, playing with the, the surface. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely, I think in ceramics, the repetition of form really does at least help me be able to experiment um, a lot with the decoration and in some ways like there are those floating tiles in the gallery too I like how they play off each other the different um, patterns and how they they read because they're all different I feel like that's sort of how we operate in today's world where somebody might be wearing a polka dotted shirt and then somebody else will have um, Hawaiian flowers on their shirt so it's just I, I do like that kind of interplay of how patterns work together yeah. And I feel like um, as artists, and this probably happens in Karen's work too, that there might be historic or perhaps contemporary inspirations in our work. And then over time, those inspirations, we absorb them and they come out in some other way and, and they become ours. Um, whether, whether it even becomes obvious anymore on the other end, but it's such an interesting thing. And I love that tie that we have with all the artists who've lived before us, you know, this continuum of creativity, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That last comment um, of yours remind, reminds me of, um, I was reading the founder of the Mungay movement. Um, so it's a Yanagi wrote a book called The Unknown Craftsman. So I was reading it through, reading through, and um, he does, this one sentence caught my eye, um, and it it's patterns are born of the people and in constant use by everybody. And so he was sort of thinking about um, that accessibility and that beauty, um, whereas, and maybe less of an ownership, but more of a communal um, sense and pattern that, right, we couldn't take a Jackson Pollock shirt or pattern and like um, wear it as a shirt, right? But we can do that with polka dots or, right, there's just this kind of um, celebration of um, accessibility. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then this is um, not a picture from the gallery, but it's a picture of a larger installation that is also a real signature of your work and what you do. And so it seemed really important to talk about one of these pieces. So um, tell us where this um, picture was from and, and a little bit about this aspect of your work? Sure. This is an installation um, at Augsburg University in Minneapolis. And the gallery is very long. I think it was, gosh, over 40 feet wide. So again, with my structure, I was thinking eight feet um, for kind of each season. So you, I don't know if it's obvious when you look, but from the left, it's sort of these gray and white tones. And then it goes into more pastels. And then you've got the warmer colors in the um, two third, three fourths the way in. And then at the end, they're more autumnal color colors. So this piece um, celebrates pattern. There are different decorative papers on the back of uh, posted on the wall first. Um, and it basically celebrates 
the richness of global tradition um, to think about patterns being, you know, all celebrated all throughout the world. And then also thinking about um, patterns in terms of our, our time and our daily lives. So right, the seasonal changes that we go through that may not be, we can't pinpoint necessarily, oh, it's definitely fall today. I mean, they're the solstices, but, um, or brushing our teeth every day or um, going to yoga class or workout, right? There are these just, the there are patterns in our daily lives that mark time. So I thought thinking about that pattern in both those ways was really interesting to me. Um, and then I incorporated real flowers um, into this installation as well as ceramic flowers to sort of hit that point home that you know the real flowers are more transient um, and will fade over time. Uh, and then the ceramic is very stable. Once it's fired, it'll last thousands of years. Um, so just trying to um, have people just stop and take a look. And um, it was really interesting to see the work change um, each day and how the flowers would dry. I wasn't really sure. Like some of the calla lilies that were bright pink turned this really dark red color. Um, so this was a, a great, I think, a, exploration into um, two-dimensional patterns and how they um, play off of my three-dimensional patterns on top of the paper. And this piece was made at a time when things were um, just a little chaotic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just um, in terms of just what was going on in the world. And I wanted to really celebrate um, decoration and um, globalism and just um, the beauty that can is found all around us. So a big inspiration for this piece was from the pattern and decoration movement, um, a feminist movement in the 1970s um, that was basically sort of reacting against minimalism and um, just cold, colder work with that wasn't basically celebrating or honoring um, decorative uh, traditions. It's just beautiful. Well, and you know, the flowers die, but then I think they, the real flowers die, but then they come back and almost the way we're talking about patterns repeating, you know, when new artists adopt them and use them. Yeah, it was, it was a big project. I, I was sweeping up the floor, I think 20 minutes before the opening, <laughs> running around, but it, it, um, it all happened. So the, so the, I, I do feel like um, I think I just wanted people to to be able to immerse, be in, immersed in more of a an environment um, when they entered that space. And yeah, it is a little more impractical in some ways these bigger pieces. Um, but it's nice that I'm able to work in both realms um, in terms of having pieces that are more accessible um, and more useful perhaps for drinking tea or um, whatnot. And then these bigger installations, the, the ideas do cross over between the two types of work. Yeah. yeah, no, it's true. Well, and the things that you make that are functional, I mean, there is something just so lovely when we use a, a handmade, you know, one of a kind or small production thing that's handmade by a person there's this wonderful thing that happens when you when you live with that and use it every day and it becomes part of your your life and your existence. Um, but and and then I think about these pieces and I I'm assuming that use of real flowers draws people in and makes them really curious and perhaps even come back numerous times to see the the exhibit and how it how it evolves. Yeah, it's, it was really wonderful because this particular gallery was in the student center in the middle of campus, so it's sort of the heart of campus. And I'd get people who um, just would come in and kind of they'd be curious and ask me what I was doing. And it took four days, I think, to install or five. And they could, with the wind, glass windows, they could see the process of it being put up. And so I'd have students come talk to me about their favorite flower or that they really love plants. Um, I had a few leftover flowers that I'd let people take. Um, and then I, even one young student, sort of there was a threshold into the gallery and she 
she peered her head in and you know said is it okay if i come in i was like please so sometimes <laughs> there is that um timidity to to enter an art space and it was really nice to have people be able to experience it through smell and also through time over the course of it being installed and then seeing the work sort of um, fade. And this piece was installed in the winter. So I think it was also nice in a cold Minnesota winter to have something a little more colorful yeah. up. Yeah. And then how long was the show up? So were the flowers completely, they were dead then at the end of the show? Yeah, um, gosh, I think it was, uh, two months per perhaps yeah 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 so I felt really fortunate to be able to to play in that space it's a little intimidating but um, yeah it's nice to problem solve and think about the format I would use yeah well it's just beautiful oh. thank, thank you. you so much um and now we're going to talk to Karen um so um, Karen, let me first, I wanna read a little bit about you. Um, Karen is a Wisconsin-based self-taught painter. She creates stunning scenes of surreal encounters between wild animals and domestic settings, exploring the boundaries of the natural and civilized worlds. Karen was born in Cleveland, Ohio. She currently resides in McQuanago. Karen began painting with no formal art training other than high school after the birth of her son in 1968. Gradually advancing and developing from art fairs to juried shows, invitationals, and galleries. The work evolved from rural scenes, figures, and still lives into a traditional wildlife format. In 1982, after a two-year period of soul searching, the work was loosed from its former moorings emerging into more imaginative settings and compositions. And I just want to, um, a little anecdote. I, I think Karen, you know this, we've been representing your work for quite a while now. And um, I was aware of your work from seeing it at art fairs before I knew you um, and had always admired it. And I remember the day you came in the gallery and said, I'm Karen Holt. And I don't know if I also needed an image to jolt my memory, but I just remember thinking, well, I don't need to think about this. Of course, we're gonna show your work. Um, and at that point, I was only familiar with your surreal work and I didn't know your background, which through years of us chatting, I find out about your, um, your moving, being self-taught, which is amazing to me because your, your technique is so sophisticated um, and then your movement from a more traditional wildlife art to such a signature signature style is just marvelous. So Karen, thanks for joining us. And the work in this show is, is beautiful. And um, this painting in particular called Perched is one of the favorites and pe people just keep coming in and talking to it. So talking to us about it. So tell us about this piece. Well, um, yes, Perch, um, I think the thing that drove this painting was the shape of the pose, um, that slight lean forward um, and the, the drapery of the fabric. And it, it found its own way onto a branch, um, sometimes, Images, images place themselves where they need to be. Um, and yeah, and for me, this is an extremely clean painting. It is very simple. Um, and I wanted that feeling of being up above. I, I think it's, it's a perspective uh, we, especially, you know, during last year and continuing into this year, even that, that ability to gain some perspective above all that sometimes wants to swallow us up um, and keep us from keeping life in perspective. Um, and so it's a feeling of being able to breathe, um, to maybe find that perspective. Um, and, and there again, she's 
you know, she's got the um, the thread with the origami crane on it, and um, you know, yeah, she's able to put that out there. Um, but the, can't you know? Origami. Every, pardon me. Oh, finish what you were going to say, and then I'll ask you my question. I was just going to say right now, looking at the background reminds me of Julie's, some of Julie's blue blue wear. Um, yeah, the yeah. No, yeah, that's it's yeah, they're beautiful together. No, I was gonna. I know that um, origami, um, specifically origami cranes, have shown up in your work over the years many, many times. And yes. do you remember the origin of your interest in that symbol? Um, well, I think of uh, the thousand cranes. Um, I think of of that whole tradition, you know, making a thousand cranes and having, uh, having the effort um, speak to peace uh, and putting that out there. Um, and for myself, it's light coming through paper. Um, I've photographed origami cranes a number of times and playing with the light and having, having the beauty of the light shine through and show the structure of the origami. Um, it's just kind of something I love doing. And, and then the last, cause you know, everything in your paintings means something. So the book, has she just stopped reading the book? Do you think to yourself what that book is? I mean. <laughs> or it could be a journal. Oh. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't necessarily need to fill in all the specifics, but um, yeah, I think in my own personal life, the way I have been able to, you know, grow in meditation and grow to embody more peace in my life. A lot of that has come through books and authors. Um, and so I treasure that. That kind of has been my journey um, and my guidance ha has come to me that way. Um, yeah. And for people who haven't seen the show yet in person, um, you paint in acrylic on panels. Yes. And on, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and you get these really beautiful thin layers and veils of color, and there's a depth and a richness that you get, which is, I mean, I think the pictures are actually pretty good, but when you see them in person, they're just, they just glow. Yeah, I, um, so, and I can say this for sure in this one, the background, um, there is no white paint. Um, what is white or almost white is, I don't think that there's anything that can substitute. Um, and I use a, a Grumbach or um, gesso, um, but it's the gesso showing through. In other words, this is, this is very transparent. There's really not a whole lot of light. Um, or I mean paint right. on the background of that panel. And if you look at, um, and the bird happens to be a flicker, by the way, and I love flickers. Um, Why do you uh, love flickers? Oh my goodness. <laughs> They're so much fun. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're not familiar with a flicker, if you could see further down um, that flicker's chest, a flicker is filled with polka dots. Oh, um, yeah, and the how handsome they are! We're Just all very handsome. Their that. throat, the black throat, um, the red on the back of the neck, and you know, it's always my intention to bring you a little bit closer to that bird to um, to see how beautiful it is. Um, and I, I think that's what I bring from my, my more traditional wildlife um, when I was pursuing that, that course, thinking that that's where I was going. Um, I wanted you to see them. I wanted you to fall in love with them. And so, you know, I bring that same specific 
Look at that feather. Um, yeah. You know, look at the light. Look at the dark. Um, and then work it into a something that's very human, a piece of clothing. Um, and I don't always, I don't always do that. Um, you know, a lot of the birds, uh, like in tamarind tea, it's it's just the tamarind. It's not blended with a human figure, but um, yeah. It's just great. Thank you. Okay, this one, Pace of Peace, I believe it's called, right? Right, the Pace of Peace. Yeah, and peace is a motif that comes up a lot in your work. Yeah. And here's some more origami. Yeah, I, you know, I wasn't doing this intentionally, but there, there's a number of pieces with the origami in it. But um, yeah, I, last year was a, such an unpeaceful year and just really made me aware of what a gigantic work it is to, to have peace come forward more and more. Um, and it, yeah, let there, it sounds so trite, but the truth is let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Um, and, the, and the path, even for, for us to grow individually, um, to embody more peace in our life. It, the path is not straight and it's slow. We transform and transition ourselves very slowly. Um, and the call to have patience with ourselves and with each other. I mean, I, how else are we going to make it? Um, and you have the, so you have a progression and in the background, the turtles are moving both ways. Um, and so you can't exactly see what path, you know, the, the hill on the left, you're not exactly sure how that intersects with the hill on the right, but, but it's that constant movement forward and you get to this in the foreground that, um, that incline, it's not straight. You get to areas where for a turtle, that little distance that he's reaching out for, um, that could be treacherous, that could be a risk. Um, and I think that that's an integral part of moving in peace, um, moving towards peace. Um, yeah. And so, so the fact, go ahead. It's the oh. fact that the cranes are, are being carried by tortoises. Yeah. Um, so ancient and very slow um, and to not give up, to not give up because it's slow or because it's hard or because it's not straight and we can't always see the road or the path that we've covered um, until we've gone a long way. When I first saw the piece, um, I also, especially looking at the ones in the background, the, it almost looked like the turtles had crowns <laughs> backs to the silver. I did not, I love that. Yeah. I love that, Teresa. Yeah. Yeah. I did not, I never saw, never yeah. once did I ever see that. But do you that's see it now a little? Yeah. Oh, oh, I absolutely do. <laughs> yeah. um, that's the great part. I mean, I know what motivated me to paint the piece. But the wonderful part is it's unfinished in so far as, you know, until there's a response, which that you just shared your response, until there's a response, you don't know what you've done. I, I'm just following the idea and the idea was around and the name of the painting was around way many years before the actual painting was. Um, and I just love the pace of peace because I thought how, um, yeah, how, how slow it is, how difficult it is. Um, yeah. But what I wanted to get to was the response. I mean, I, other people complete 
what has happened here. Um, you know, I'm just faithful as best I can be to the idea. Um, but once it's out there, it stays alive. Um, as far as, you know, if it talks to somebody else, it stays, stays alive and continues to evolve, really. Yeah. And I think you said something so important that, that all artists think about is, um, you know, leaving works just enough open-ended so that the viewer has a place to really get in and that and that it really is important. Sometimes people will come in and say, what, they wanna know exactly what is this painting about? And, mm -hmm. and, but then there's something freeing in telling them, it's really, the artist wants you to bring whatever you bring to it. It's not. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if we hope to reach people with our work in whatever way, um, yeah, we don't want to give them the whole story. Um, well, we don't give them the whole story. I can only take you so far into that painting. And isn't that great? Yeah. Um, because you have a part in it. Yeah. And now I can't stop seeing the little turtle up, like reaching and feeling bad for it. Like, are you going <laughs> to make it, little fella? <laughs> yeah, I know. And, they're, and they're, they're, their legs are their legs are so stubby <laughs> that I know that looks like just a small gap. But for him, he is taking a risk to get over that chasm. I mean, and yeah. we have to do that. Yeah. We, we have to do what we can to bridge the gap between us and others and to find peace with um, the rest of the created order. Um, yeah. Good. Well, let's look at this, another piece. Um, this is called Unglued. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, none of us likes the term or the implications of unglued. Um, and yet there's an, an acknowledgement there that sometimes the only way we can move forward is through becoming unglued, through becoming, oh, I even hate to say it, di disrupted, because I'm not somebody who likes to be disrupted. But um, yeah, when things become unglued, other things are revealed, things we weren't even aware of. Um, and the fact that it's a bird rising up from you know the torn unglued paper um that's a sign of hope um the unexplored um the new life kind of idea um things are revealed now and there are slight if you look closely even on the screen you do even i have to get up close um there's very lightly written words um, one of them is hidden, um, and, um, I never noticed that. Yes. So <laughs> I, I, pur I purposely, you know, wrote them very lightly. Um, and so it's, it's what's behind the paper. Uh, what do we find? What do we explore in ourselves? <sighs> Once that paper is ripped away you know, the paper of that, that perfect piece of wallpaper. Um, there are things there. There are things there. And so what, what maybe is hidden while the paper is intact becomes accessible um, and becomes something to be valued. Um, And what kind of a bird is this? That is a scissor-tailed flycatcher. <laughs> Aren't they just amazing? Beautiful. Yes, there are. Um, the, there is more than one variety of um, scissor tail. Um, Can I see these in Wisconsin? No, not okay. in Wisconsin. Um, I believe that they are west of the Mississippi. I'm going to say in the southwest. Um, uh, Perhaps Texas. Yeah, they're um, Texas bird. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but, but what a graceful, amazing bird. Um, yeah. And Those what an elegant bird. Letters. It's crazy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I love the trompe quality because you see it and you think, could the bird, at first you think, could the bird be just part of this wallpaper? And then you realize mm -hmm. that it's dimensional, but then you're playing with this idea because it's painting and it's flat. And so, you know, you really, it's, um, there's a playfulness in that too, which I think is really great. There is. And I, I do like playfulness. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to remind people that they are welcome to type questions in uh, if they're on Facebook, um, or they can text questions to the gallery at 608-845-6600. Um, I don't know, Anne or Lauren, do you have any um, anything for either of these artists that questions that you've been thinking about or things that have questions you have now after you've heard them chat a little bit? Yeah, I have a question for um, Karen about these, do these paintings start, you know, as you were a wildlife artist, do they still start with the animals or it, does it, is, do you have a different starting place now that you are no longer doing wildlife? Um, I think the love of the birds just, just, they're beautiful, the love of the bird. Um, sometimes um, a wonderful pose will um, develop a whole background around it. Um, or as in uh, the pace of peace, that, that phrase was, it just, it came to me one day and it was so powerful that um, I just waited until, yeah, really, it, uh, the animals filled it in, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, the whole idea of using tortoises and, um, yeah, peace being carried on their backs, um, they're being very slow and ancient, yeah. Ancient, very ancient. Oh, that's a good word, Lauren, really. Um, this this ancient um, quest, this ancient um, thing that we have the potential to embody, what makes us fully human um, and act human towards um, each other. Mm -hmm. I actually had a question for Karen too, because your compositions are just there's so much meaning behind each piece. And so I'm wondering how, how long it, um, it takes you to like, do some compositions just come to you and others take a while to, to merge together. And, um, and do you work on three paintings at once or in terms of like, how did, how your working process flows? The answer to the first question is yes. Both, both those things. Um, yeah, sometimes you have a part of the painting and you you think you're ready to start and then you start and you go, whoa, there's a whole lot of things I haven't worked out for this painting. And so you may get as far as a sketch and then, you know, maybe put it aside. Um, and um, what was the second question? Um, oh, do you, do you, yeah, so do you work? Oh, work on more than one piece. Not when it comes to actually uh, getting a full-blown sketch, getting it composed, and getting it started. Um, I, I may get as far as a sketch on something and then just realize it isn't developed enough. But actually working on the painting, um, no, it's one at a time. Yeah. Do you ever do sketches and then think, I'm not interested in this and toss it away? Hmm. Yeah. Not much. Not much. <laughs> I, I have a hard time parting with a sketch um, because I'm 
always thinking it's just not there yet or um and there's a beauty in a pencil sketch I guess I don't know so yeah I kind of I hang on to them it's it's not like there isn't any you know it's not like I haven't crumpled something up ever but um yeah. I try to crumple it in my brain um before it gets to that point um and yeah. re you know rethink it or redo it that way yeah Julianne I imagine you have uh, lots of things happening at the same time in your studio. Yeah. Yep. I have my to-do list and like the basic structure, right. Of like numbers or like what kind of forms I want to make. And then, um, and then many deadlines, like, you know, for really big projects, like I know I have to make X number of flowers that day or I'm behind, um, or this, uh, year was tricky. Um, I, father had passed away so I had to keep working on projects right so I just um you know uh had to set some silly deadlines sometimes like if I don't get you know this one sculpture done I can't go for a walk with my friend <laughs> uh, right so just little ways to keep you going um but yeah I think it's helpful to work on multiple things for me just so that I don't get too um narrowly focused, I think. Um, I yeah. Also step back and take a look. I also had like another question for Karen. Yeah, um, no. So often it, it's interesting to see like um, Teresa was talking about the Trump Loy aspect of this painting. And then you do have like the still life aspects and the ceramic dishes and then like the clothing. So I'm wondering in your inclusion of the like the ceramic um, dishes which are so beautifully done in your work and the the clothing is it a way to kind of add that connection to human the human it is yeah. it is it's by inviting uh by inviting the birds and the animals into those settings we yeah i i've tried to come up with uh statements often on that that express that so in my work, it's the birds and animals that have a wisdom, a wisdom that we need. We don't have on our own. And if we don't connect in some way naturally, um, and my paintings are just one way of, so, so they're re in my paintings, they're reaching out to us to soften that, um, that lack of contact that we have um, with with nature the way we really should. Um, and we spend far too many hours and not a lot of time observing. So they're coming into our environment, but also include in that environment, like the um, unglued here, beautiful papers, things that we have created. Um, ways we are inspired um, by the natural world. But in my paintings, it's the birds and the animals and those combined bird animal or uh, bird human or figures that um, they're the teachers. They're coming in. They're softening our hard edges, um, our facts, you know, the tyranny of time and numbers kind of thing. <laughs> They're knocking on our doors. They're knocking on our windows. Um, they're, they're walking through the door. They're sitting on the edge of the bed. They're <laughs> sitting on the limb outside my studio window and with a with little sign perched. Yeah. Um, they're trying to get in. Um, yeah, they're, they're the wise ones. That's great. Um, and you know what, I think I failed to mention this at the beginning, because we're now we're talking about other things, also alluding to things that we haven't looked at, but the whole show is available online. Um, so you can look at all of the pieces of Julianne's and you can look at all the paintings of Karen's. Um, the video that we looked at at the beginning will be available later and this talk will be available later to watch again or tell people about. Um, but yeah, you can look at 
at all the pieces and um, see all of Karen's um, little birds and your monkeys and turtles and, <laughs> and a couple of humans. Yeah. Um, Anne? So oh, there are no audience questions tonight. All right. It's kind of quiet out there, I guess. But I just, what a delight it has been to talk to the both of you and get to know the work a little bit more. And it's been really lovely to have this beautiful grouping, this beautiful pairing in the gallery. So thank you both. Thanks yeah. for the, the gallery and thanks, Karen, for sharing this space with me. Your, your work's oh. gorgeous. Thank you, Julianne. Um, I, yeah, we were good for each other and we have, yeah, we have um, Teresa and Anne and Lauren too. Um, I'm very grateful that they paired us together. Great. It's just stunning. And um, I hope people, um, you know, if you don't live in the area, you know, visit the show as much as you want online. But if you can make it, the show is up through September 12th. Um, and the and we're open Tuesdays through Sundays from 10 to 5. And it's just an outstanding exhibit. So I hope people will come and see it. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.